Yes, my name is Morten Kynrich and I'm from uh, Danish Technological Institute and I will be uh, the chairman of this uh, session. So uh, we'll just wait a little bit to uh, be sure we have everybody on board. So I can see that people have started to join. So uh, I will give the word to uh, Gerald Lambos Ofandis from and he will talk about resilient long-range wireless communication. Exactly. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, we hear you. Okay. So I will share my screen now to uh, see that everything is okay. So perhaps you can see also my slides now. Right. So uh, shall I start right now or do you want to wait a little bit more? I think we should uh, proceed. Okay, um, so um, before I start, perhaps my presentation is a little bit technical for today. So at any point, just um, stop me and ask me questions. I think it's more important to uh, more people understand what I'm working on than cover all the material. Uh, then, good afternoon and thank you for joining my presentation. My name is uh, Harala Busurfanidis and I joined as a postdoc in DTU a couple of weeks ago. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work I did as a PhD student in uh, KTH Stockholm and Uppsala University about uh, low power wide area networks. Uh, this figure is illustrating a smart city with applications that include uh, many sensors over long grades. Uh, many of them operate in license spectrum, but some other operate in unlicensed spectrum. And as this device increase, we will have an environment with a wireless interference from many diverse independent networks coexisting. And this will lead in several issues, oh, sorry, several issues as we see in the next slides. Uh, low power uh, wide area networks uh, are offering uh, wireless communication, which uh, 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 operate either in license or a license spectrum and can have long range coverage and the data rate is low and they can operate by battery since the energy consumption is low. Perhaps you've heard about LoRa. This is one of the most popular LP1 platforms uh, using uh, the unlicensed spectrum. And it's famous because it has a communication range approximately 10 kilometers in line of sight. Uh, the data rate here is uh, low, up to 27 kilobps. The modulation is a chip spectrum and the bandwidth can have different values. Uh, IEEE 802.15.4G or YSAN is also using the license spectrum. It's another LP1 with lower range, higher data rate, FSK modulation, and here has a fixed bandwidth. What I'm trying to stress out with this slide is that uh, the deployed LP vans may be heterogeneous in several levels. And the unlicensed, the unlicensed spectrum, it's an attractive option since it does not include any additional cost to use it or any administra administrative overhead uh, to deploy a network uh, as long as you follow the regulation constraints. As a result, we see that uh, the number of the independent wireless networks increasing. And consequent, consequently, the probability of having networks operating um, uh, in the same environment and using the same in frequency increases as well. And we know that um, these networks might use the channel differently. So it's a challenge to coordinate and eventually they will compete for uh, transmission time. In that case, it is very likely to see frame collisions. Um, therefore, the first problem I will talk about today is at our, our attempt to quantify how much interference LoRa and Wysan can tolerate. And uh, what we will see is that both radios, both radios affect each other, but LoRa is more resilient. And then after we, saw, uh, we see that uh, LP1 performance might be affected in a coexistence scenario, uh, we thought that uh, the collision avoidance mechanism uh, should be tested and improve, uh, improved if there is uh, the requirement. 
that is why the next problem I would try to address uh, was to check uh, uh, why some default collision avoidance mechanism under lower transmissions and the results uh, showed that it is not very accurate but there are some ways to be improved. Uh, the presentation though it's oriented around those two problems I briefly mentioned and now I'm going to give a little bit more technical details and first I will start with uh, investigation of cross technology interference between LP bands. Uh, and by cross technology interference I refer to wireless signals that are coming from uh, different technologies but they are transmitted in the same frequency band that uh, your network uses and might colon collide with uh, transmissions and affect the performance of the network. Uh, I focused on H68 megahertz band since this is the frequency band used in EU and some LP bands that might coexist here is uh, LoRa, Wysan, Sigfox and uh, these days no, no, an our band IoT is in license but it's in the same frequency though. Uh, the research question we try to answer in this problem is when LoRa and Wysan coexist how much can tolerate of each other's interference and uh, some of the physical characteristics of LoRa have already been mentioned like the modulation but uh, what I would like to stress out here is that there are some characteristics like the bandwidth which is how wide is the channel in, uh, used in LoRa and the spreading factor which is the, the ratio of symbols and separate but what is important to know from this is that these two characteristics are can alter the signal in a large degree. And then some of the physical characteristics of Wysan uh, have been mentioned also like uh, modulation. And then uh, we see that when these two, uh, when that these 12 band use the same frequency band and if they use also the same channel, frame collisions are very likely to occur. Uh, in order to evaluate the robustness of these two uh, selected LP bands, we used an uh, anechoic chamber to eliminate any source of uh, external interference and have a solid control of the environment. So this is the layout we used. We have um, uh, uh, the nodes as showed in the picture. There are two, uh, two Wysan, one, uh, one sender, one receiver and one LoRa acting as interferer. So we repeat this scenario several times, uh, changing some configuration parameters like the spreading factor and bandwidth uh, from LoRa mentioned before. Also the used channels in Wysan and uh, of course transmission power in both radios. And then we follow the similar scenario to check uh, the tolerance of uh, LoRa uh, in uh, uh, Wysan interference. Uh, the metric we used here is uh, the packet received ratio, which is the ratio of the transmitted packets to the successfully transmit uh, to the successfully received ones. Right, and uh, this figure is illustrating the channelization of the two radios, how the two radios are using uh, the spectrum, and uh, we have Wysan at the bottom. Uh, there are 34 channels here to, uh, to 200 kilohertz each and in the figure we see channel 24 from channel 28 and the black bullets are representing uh, the frequencies used in FSK modulation to transmit zero and ones to encode information. And at the top we have uh, LoRa um, um, where the central frequency and the bandwidth is defining the channel. So in the experiments I will present later, we always used H68.3 central frequency. And if we use a bandwidth of 125 kilohertz with this frequency, we see that it overlaps completely with channel 26. And then if we increase the bandwidth, we see that it overlaps with channel 25 as well and so on. Uh, and the obtained results uh, are represented with heat maps. So this figure represents uh, a packet received ratio of Wysan under LoRa interference. And every rectangle here corresponds to a packet received ratio value. 
and the color is representing the percentage. We have dark blue from 100% uh, as it is indicated from the color bar and if, it's, if it is zero, uh, it should be white. And on the x-axis, we have the channel used from Wysan. Uh, on the top x-axis, we have the transmission power. And on the y-axis, we have the LoRa TX power, which is interfering in that case. Uh, for example, if we take the bottom left uh, rectangle, uh, in that case, uh, we have uh, a, a Wysan communication which achieved 100% packet received ratio. It was using channel 24 and it was transmitting with uh, 2 dBm while LoRa was interfering with 2 dBm. This is a larger set of results uh, of the same scenario. And what we see here is that uh, just channel 26 is affected. And uh, this is uh, expected since we use uh, bandwidth 125. And if we go back to the um, spectrum allocation figure, we see that uh, the only channel uh, is affecting, uh, LoRa is affecting, in that case, it's channel 26. And furthermore, we see that when the transmission power of YSAN is increased, some of the um, uh, packets are successfully received. And as we increase the bandwidth, here is with uh, 250 kilohertz, we see that two channels are affected. And if we increase it more, three or four for some cases, uh, channels are affected. Uh, another interesting result we saw uh, is uh, how the uh, change of the physical characteristics of LoRa can change the interactions of the two signals. So this figure represents uh, LoRa and YSAN uh, signals interacting, but the only difference between the two figures are that in the left we have spreading factor seven and on the right spreading factor I eight. And this is captured with a software defined radio. Uh, so when the, this value changes in spreading factor, we see that uh, the chips angle changes as well. And this results to uh, a different degree of overlap between the two signals and also less or more type of overlap since the chip, uh, the chips uh, sweep the bandwidth faster or slower. So in general, Wysan was able to tolerate more of LoRa interference while LoRa was using uh, less spreading factor values. And this is the opposite case than before, LoRa being interfered by Wysan interference. And uh, if you look uh, on the lower part with, uh, where LoRa uses spring factor nine, uh, we see that from this point and on, it's 100% uh, packet received ratio. So this shows that LoRa is more robust and resilient to cross technology interference than, uh, um, than Wysan. Uh, what we learn from this study is that LoRa is uh, more robust and it's able to tolerate 15 dB of signal to interference, interference ratio from Wysan. And Wysan on the other side uh, is able to tolerate um, 6 dB of signal to interference ratio from LoRa. And its tolerance, it depends on uh, LoRa's spreading factor and bandwidth. So these results give insights for uh, both uh, platforms which could help designing uh, collision avoidance mechanism and provide robustness and reliability to the higher layers of the network. Uh, moving on to the next problem we investigated, this is about evaluating and improving collision avoidance mechanism uh, for LP vans. Uh, so LoRa does not have any collision avoidance mechanism against uh, uh, different networks than LoRa, so it just wakes up and transmits regardless if any other transmissions are going on, which is not a big problem for other LoRa devices, but it's a major issue for other networks which are operating within the same environment, like Wysan, which we saw before. Uh, Wysan on the other side has a collision avoidance mechanism, which in this slide, I will try to explain you how it works. Uh, so it's called clear channel assessment mechanism. And uh, 
it captures eight received signal strength indication values. Essentially, it captures the energy from the channel and uh, then it compute, computes the average from these values. And if the average is below a threshold, it declares the channel clear and then it's free to send the packet. If not, it declares the channel busy and the backup takes place. So in this presentation, I will refer to this mechanism as CCA default. Uh, so the research question we try to address here is if this mechanism, the CCA, is able to cope under LoRa interference, because this is designed uh, for uh, uh, Wysan networks mostly. Uh, yeah, Wysan uh, is one of them, uh, LP Vance I mentioned before, which is based on the IEEE 802.15.4G standard. And this one using the mechanism I told you. Uh, the main drawback here is when it comes to detect other LP vans, which uh, if you remember, I, I mentioned that uh, it can be heterogeneous in uh, several ways. So in that case, it's not very accurate and that results on uh, an inefficient utilization of the channel. Uh, to answer all the previous questions, we developed our own test bed and generated a data set which characterizes interactions of the two networks. And using this data, we saw that um, Wysan is not able to detect LoRa. That's why it proposed an improved version based on a classifier, which is at the same time compatible with the uh, IEEE standard. Uh, and again, this is a similar picture captured with a software defined radio. We have uh, signals of the two radios uh, interacting. Diagonal lines start for the chirps coming from LoRa and horizontal uh, lines are FSK signals coming from Wysan. Uh, it's also marked with a white circle. So while the LoRa chirps, chirps go through the spectrum, they're sensed by Wysan with CCA and the effectiveness of this mechanism can be influenced by how uh, strength, how powerful are the signals, and then um, the degree of overlap, the channel offset of these two networks, and then the parameters, the LoRa parameters, which define the physical characteristics of the chip. Uh, so this is the test that uh, I was uh, talking before. This is a LoRa node acting as interferer, and then we have a Wysan sender and receiver uh, connected with an RF combiner, and then we have signal attenuators ev everywhere to make sure that we have the same signal uh, every end of the uh, every end of the of the test bed. And uh, the first thing we did was to collect an amount of data. To do so, uh, we followed the following steps. First, the sender was taking 15 of these RSA values, and then it was sending the frame regardless of the uh, channel status and the CCA decision. And then the receiver here um, records if this frame is arrived successfully or not. And then LoRa all the time here is acting as interferer. Uh, after having all this data, we're trying to investigate a little bit uh, uh, more detailed how the CCA works. So this figure is depicting a typical trace of uh, 200 RSA values captured from Wysan. Uh, on the x-axis, we, we are approaching uh, the time now. Um, so if you could... Uh, okay, maybe I will skip some slides and I will just give you some results then. So we managed to increase the accuracy from 43% to 73%. And then here is some other results that uh, our uh, mechanism, uh, which the orange one, the enhanced one, uh, at the beginning it seems that it's able to send um, less packages than the default. But here is uh, another uh, metric showing the wrong decisions this mechanism can take. And uh, uh, because we're able to decrease a lot the uh, unsuccessful transmissions, uh, we have several gains. Uh, we decrease the energy consumption and we create less interference in the channel. So we use the channel more efficiently. Uh, this is the conclusion. Uh, 
uh, we were able to uh, evaluate the CCA mechanism and then we improved it. At the same time, we make it still uh, uh, compatible with the IEEE standard. And uh, this is the takeaway message that uh, uh, I have today for you. LP van coexistence will be very crucial for reliable and robust uh, applications in uh, smart cities and industry 4.0. And uh, that's all for me. Yes, uh, thank you, John Lambas, for for your uh, talk on uh, interference and radio communication. Next talk is Cobot Lift, and I will uh, share my screen. And um, I will also be the one that moves the slides around while Fleming is talking. So the word is yours, Fleming. Thank you, Ron, for the nice introduction. Hi, my name is Fleming Fools, and I'm from the company Cobalt Lift, and also the inventor of Cobalt Lift system that I would like to tell you about today. In 2019, we were granted a Cobalt Award, and today I would like to tell you how that went and how it has influenced our robot system and our Cobalt company. Uh, the Cobalt Lift consists of three components, a UR10 uh, from the Universal Robot, a vacuum tube lifter, and a Cobalt Lift tool uh, that enables the robot to control the movements of the vacuum tube lifter. That means the vacuum tube lifter is doing the heavy lifting and the robot is only controlling the lifting. This combination of technologies gives us a very compact robotic solution. And as you can see on the slide, uh, a very small footprint as the robot is mounted directly in the vacuum tube core. As a new and small company, uh, the safety aspect of a robotic solution can be a bit overwhelming. So for us, it has been very rewarding to be part of the, the cover project. And in the cover project, we were helped by the Danish Technological Institute uh, in identifying the relevant standards requirements for our particular system. Uh, we got some ob objective data from collision testings, also done at Danish Technological Institute, uh, and we were given some relevant input to risk assessments and were uh, in the end uh, able to guide our integrators better in making safe installations for their customers. Another great benefit of the cover project turned out to be in our sales department. Uh, being new on the market with a new type of product can be hard uh, when talking to large global customers like BMW, Nestle, Unilever, and Aurodis, etc., where safety is prioritized extremely high. Being part of the cover project, uh, knowing the relevant standards and requirements, and being able to back it up with objective data turned out to be the key for us to get access to these types of customers. So that was very cool. And the side effect we hadn't considered when entering the project. Alternative solutions. Uh, typical alternatives for heavy and repetitive lifting today is either handled manually by an operator with a vacuum tube lifter or an industrial, typical industrial robot in a cage. Uh, the corporate lift can, in most cases, work collaboratively. It's very compact and is able to eliminate manual handling. Due to the powerful vacuum system, we're also able to lift up to 45 kg uh, products with a small lightweight robot like the UR10. Um, yeah, just to, to give you a few ideas of how we can use it, uh, I have brought three different cases with me uh, to show you some of the possibilities and the different challenges we have had when installing our system as uh, end customers. Uh, the first one is from Danali Vilkø, it's a little south of Copenhagen. Uh, this was our first installation and it has been running now for almost three years, uh, three shift operation. And they're lifting soft plastic sacks with plaster for walls. Uh, so this is a very liquid product. Uh, they're doing five sacks per minute, three shifts a day. So uh, some of the safety challenges that we had at Danley were how to handle 
loss of vacuum in case of power failure. Uh, because these bags are folding when we're lifting them, uh, they need a very high airflow to be grabbed uh, and lifted from the conveyor to the cardboard boxes. And that means that when we, if we are, we're dropping them immediately, if the power is off to the vacuum pump. But instead of adding expensive backup supply to our three kilowatt uh, vacuum pump, we solved it by changing the trajectories and using the layout of the large cardboard boxes in a more active manner. And only moving the robot where no people have access. Uh, another case, uh, the next one here is from Glava in Norway. It's uh, uh, part of the St. Cobain group and uh, this installation was uh, actually handled 100% by a student and the technical manager at Glava. Uh, when they were done, they just sent us a video of the system running, so we weren't involved in the installation at all. As you can see, the speed of this installation is quite low. Uh, only one pick per minute, but uh, most of the systems we have sold so far is actually with cycle charge between one and four picks per minute uh, for these heavy products. But uh, due to the rather soft and large insulation packs, the most dangerous situation was actually removing the robot without any load. Uh, but with our rounded tool um, and a big suction cup, to lift the product, this wasn't causing any issues either. And during our uh, collision test at the Danish Technological Institute, we also learned that we could actually move our robot uh, with the rubber suspended tool relatively fast without exceeding uh, the re recommended impact forces, uh, impact force values in ISO 15066. And the last one uh, I have brought is uh, from Danfoss Drives in Sønderborg. Uh, they're moving some big test fixtures uh, they use for testing the frequency drives. Uh, that's also a rather low speed, but uh, due to the design of the fixtures, they have very sharp edges. They have decided from the very beginning to add some fencing and scanners to avoid any dangerous situations at all. That could also be an, an alternative in the end. Uh, this installation was also handled by a student and a member at Danfoss uh, technical staff. So in this case, we weren't involved in either. Uh, only a bit of support on the point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I hope these three cases have given you an idea about the flexibility of our system and maybe also better understanding of the, the variety the safety issues that might occur in each individual installation and risk assessment. If you want to see more cases and know more about cooperative, please uh, take a look at our web webpage or give me a call. I'll be glad to uh, give you some more details. Thank you and uh, now back to you Morten. Yes, and I will uh, tell a little about uh, some of the tests we did for Cooperative. So, um, we performed a test series where we had different payloads uh, lifted by the, the system, different speeds, and then we had a force measurement device to, to measure resulting forces from collisions. And on the right, we see some pain um, values from a technical specification where 100 test persons uh, were told to tell when they uh, registered pain and uh, it was a study uh, conducted by a university in Mainz and um, it was uh, we are simply trying to 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 say where are the limits for pain so it's not injury that we're talking about here uh, those forces would be higher um, but we're basically uh, only working with, with pain so, so an example of a collision from uh, the lab from our lab, and you see the force sensor there and an impact from the system. And we got some results from that, and um, 
basically if we take the stomach area then you can move at half meter per second with an 18 kilograms of payload and if you take for example the upper part of the, the leg then you can move a bit faster uh, if if you have no payload for example that could be the return scenario where you have just placed an item somewhere you want to return to the to the pickup place and uh, if you have a payload of 30 kilos then you you can go you should go a bit slower and i can uh, say as well here that cobalt lift actually moves uh, slower than uh, what is uh, listed here so it's not cycle time that is important uh, for this application but it's actually to to replace uh, the worker and lessen the, the 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 load of workers so you don't get these uh, stress on the on the on the body that you get from the traditional solutions so i think that concludes as some some points that we saw is that you need to be aware of okay what is the contact area you have in the end effector you're designing so if you can maximize the contact area that's good also the elasticity of the tool can lower the impact forces so if you have some some spring-like effect in the tool that can sort of give and take a bit of the forces then you can also lower your your transient impact forces when you return without a product then you can go a bit faster so so that was some of the learnings we had that concludes our talk and we will move to Lars Peter Elgil from Enabled Robotics. And I will leave the stage for Lars Peter. Yes, so can you hear me? Can you, can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, good, yeah. So my name is Lars Pidelikile. I come from a company named Enable Robotics, where we are specialized in combining the mobility of mobile robots with robot arms. <clears throat> and in this presentation, I'll talk a bit about some of the safety aspects of these kind of systems and the work we did in our cover project. But first, briefly introduce the product such that everyone knows the kind of thing I'm talking about. So what we do is that we take some standard hardware components, we use a robot arm from Universal Robots, use a, see it just got a pop-up from Zoom somewhere, and we use a standard mobile robot from Mir, and then we combine the two things. And in the combination, there's of course some hardware and electronics, but where we actually have our focus is on creating an easy to use system, which means that we need to make an easy to use interface for the thing. And we need to develop some application specific modules. And for this kind of system, when we combine a mobile robot and a robot arm, for this to be truly valuable, it needs to be safe. When we have these systems, it's quite logical that the robot will have to drive around, meaning it will have to share space with humans. So there's no possibilities for putting cages around the robot and similar for these kind of things. Now this is a track with industry in mind, so therefore I thought I would give an example of where these kind of systems could be used. So if we have sort of a typical factory, we have some area where we store components and consumables, and then there's a logistic task of taking these and bring them into the factory floor where they're needed. And this is one of the places where we see a great use of our robot and technology. So it could be to feed the manual assembly station with boxes in a Kanban style. It could also be feeding a fully automated line where the feeders need to be provided with new parts. And once stuff is finished on the factory floor, then they need to be moved into the warehouse from where they can be shipped out. So there are quite a few of these internal logistic tasks where it makes sense to start using these kind of robots which in contrast to a normal mobile robot 
has the ability to actually take the parts or the boxes from where they're located on shelf and put them in the right location and not relying on having some dedicated station in the end to load and unload or having humans present there. So now I mentioned that we use both me and you are robots and both are sort of branded as collaborative robots. And then once you combine them, the big question is of course, does this mean we have a collaborative robot as default as well? And as I'm sure all of you know, the answer is quite simply no, it doesn't make our system collaborative. First of all, collaborative will always depend on the application and the environment into which the robots are to be used. And the main safety concerns which we see with our system is, of course, collision between robot and human while operating. It is the stability. What happens if the robot falls over? Or can it lose stability and fall over? And what happens if object falls from it? And in the cover project, we went in and did a bit of a dive into these things to analyze the problems and the challenges. And for collision, we have three different modes of operation. In the first, we can look at what happens if there's a collision between the arm or manipulator while it is operating. And here we have the challenge that it's not possible to put behind fences because it's basically, it's a mobile robot arm. And using the laser scanners of the MIA, which seems like an appealing idea, is actually not very feasible because these will typically be obstructed. If we imagine that the robot drives up to a shelf to pick out parts, then there will be objects in the near vicinity of the robot. So therefore we cannot just have a general safety mark around it. We could of course as a solution look towards other sensors. There are for instance, these unexpected safety radars, which more record motions, which could be used in these kind of scenarios. Or we have to look at running the arm in a truly collaborative mode meaning we also need to make sure that the parts and the tools which we apply support collaborative use. Then there's the risk of collision while the mobile robot is driving around. And here the challenge is we need to make sure it can stop beforehand. Part of our work and cover were to see what would actually happen if we had a collision between the mobile robot and the environment. And because the mobile robot with the arm on top has a lot of moving mass, then we can basically see that even the slightest contact has the risk of uh, violating the safety precautions which were specified and which Morten just mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. And then we have the challenge that we need to make sure that the robot arm is within the footprint of the mobile robot while we drive around. So our solution, what we've done is basically check the stop time and can see that it actually stops in time, even with our modifications on. Not a big surprise because we stay within the load capabilities of the mobile robot. If for some reason we feared this, we could update the safety zones of the mobile robot and to make sure that the arm is not sticking out to one side when we drive around, there's the possibility to just find a safe configuration for it and simply block the mobile robot from moving if the arm is not in that configuration. Then there's a possibility with actually having both the manipulator and the mobile robot move at the same time. And here we'd face a challenge that the velocity of a moving part will actually be significantly higher than for the two individually if they both move in the same direction. At the same time, it would be hard to make sure that the manipulator is within the footprint of the mobile robot. And these sensors I mentioned previously, the InnoSpec safety radars, for instance, they have to get to work if we actually are moving around because then we constantly have movements in our environment. But when we actually analyze the use cases for it, we can see there little use or little need for having both move simultaneously. The amount of tasks which we can actually solve in these logistic applications while the robot is driving are so small that it's actually not worth the effort to try to make a safe system where we have a combined motion of it. Then we have the challenge around stability. And here we also have two different scenarios to look at. We have the stability while driving. And here, when we change the configuration of the arm, put load on the robot, 
we need to be sure that it will not do stability. And looking at the documentation for the mobile robots, they have a very clear specification of how you're supposed to load it such that they can ensure the stability. And what we've done is basically converted this into how can we then load our platform. We take some of the payload from the robot by mounting an arm on top, and then we need to compensate these load computations for this. Then we have this ability while the manipulator is moving. And here the challenge is that there can be some large forces and torques when the arm, for instance, tries to lift something. And especially if we're moving a heavy load and something happens such that we need to take the emergency stuff. So what we've done is we tested this, tried to put an overload on the robot running with 150% load on the arm and set up some worst case scenarios where we believe it would stress the stability the most. And I just have a small video showing such an experiment. Here we have 150% load on the robot arm, move it around to see it stable, then we take the emergency stuff and see that even in these scenarios where we run at full speed without having reduced the potential power of the robot and with a overload on the arm, we're actually still not losing our stability. Then the last of the risk we see is for falling objects. And here we have two scenarios. One is when the robot arm is actually picking up an object, where in our case, people could actually be standing close by. This is a scenario quite similar to if we were using a arm in a normal application. And because we deal with smaller arms, we will often look at the risk assessment and basically evaluate how diff or how dangerous will it actually be if we lose an object. We talk in this about industrial applications where it's quite common that people need to wear safety shoes and similar. So in general, we see a very small risk. And of course, if we feared it, it and saw a risk, again, augmenting with additional sensors would be an opportunity. Then we have the challenge of objects falling off while we are driving around. And here, of course, we could set up an initial test, putting some things on and driving between the different locations. This would be a good first try, but what would be a challenge is that there can be some unexpected events while you drive around. It could be that we need to stop due to an obstacle or an emergency stop. It could be that the robot needs to do some kind of evasive driving to drive around an obstacle or that we might drive a new route because the original path was blocked. And with this drives on a very uneven and crooked floor. So the solution for this is, of course, we need to design proper fixtures to putting things on there. Then we need to test the worst case scenarios for it and also put an overload on the amount of parts in there. And otherwise we can look at reducing the speed of the mobile robot in certain areas if, for instance, we know that this area has a very uneven and crooked floor where we risk things would fall off. So to summarize a bit on this presentation, then when we combine a robot arm or manipulator with a mobile robot, it gives some new possibilities for applications, but it also gives some new challenges also within the safety concerns. I believe many of the risks which we see and have identified, they're known from looking at robot arms and mobile robots on their own, but the challenges are a bit different because we now have this combined system. So what we have in our product is then a system where we have done in the context of the cover and beside the cover project, what we can do to prepare for safe operation, but ultimately it will always be the concrete application which requires the application specific risk assessment. So, so this was a bit on what we've done in context of the cover project. So I don't know if there's any questions or if there's time for that, Morten. No, I don't think we have the time for questions, but you are free to ask them in the chat and uh, you can maybe answer yeah. in writing. Yeah, um, otherwise, yeah, you're most welcome to just send me an email or contact me in other ways if you have some questions. Yes, thank you, Lars, for Thanks. the talk. We'll give the word to Dr. Irfan Slivio and um, let's see if we can try and end this uh, track 10 minutes past three. And I will also give you uh, indications of the timing. 
Hi everyone, thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see it now. And I'm here. Uh, so I'll try to be quick. Um, so I hope that you see my screen and you can hear me. Great. Uh, so my name is Irfan Shlio and I'm currently working at NASA in Research Center uh, in, in California. So uh, early morning for me. Um, I'll present some, some works uh, regarding the model-based safety engineering that I worked uh, recently in, in, in um, Maladern University in Sweden and uh, how we've continued it here uh, at the Ames Center and uh, what kind of uh, project we worked on and, and tool support that we have uh, to do those things, the research that we've done before, uh, in particular regarding contract-driven assurance. So I'll start with basics. So safety is freedom from unacceptable risk caused by hazards. Um, and where a hazard is a system state or set of conditions that together with the worst case environmental condition will lead to an accident. Why we started with this uh, to emphasize that uh, safety is a system level property. So, and it's a context specific property, meaning we need to, when we deal with safety and, and uh, what is safety relevant, we need to put that into the context of things. Uh, so. Um, meaning safety of, uh, for example, if we're talking about a car, it's a different thing whether the car is uh, maneuvering something on a parking in, or in a controlled environment, or a robot if it's in a controlled environment, or if it's in, in a less controlled environment like uh, uh, amongst other uh, humans and, and stuff like that, or uh, in, in a city, driving in a city or driving in a highway. Those are all environmental conditions that are very important uh, from perspective of safety. Uh, and when we deal with, so I've dealt with different industries and in all the different industries, someone also mentioned standards. There are standards, safety standards that we need to follow. Uh, and quite a few of them, at least, let's say in space, uh, uh, in airspace, in, in uh, railways, automotive, construction equipment, in, even manufacturing, uh, we need to uh, develop some kind of a safety case uh, to show that our products are safe enough uh, to be deployed. Uh, so I, I usually like to explain this as in um, you're put, companies are put in a position to advocate for their products, uh, to uh, put an argument and the case uh, why our product is good enough, it's safe enough uh, to, to be deployed. And that argument can be uh, either document uh, in a textual language or it can be a, a more structured uh, goal orientation or this graphical orientation uh, to clearly outline why exactly uh, do you believe that all the things that you've done uh, leads to a safe enough product. So uh, there has been various uh, definitions of what this safety case is. Uh, use this, uh, the popular one, uh, it's a documented, uh, safety case documented in the form of a structured argument. Uh, so this argument itself is the spine of the safety case and its goal is to communicate how the objectives, requirements, safety objectives are met by the different evidence that you have gathered during the development. Uh, this argument can be, as I said, uh, it can be a textual thing, but it can all, it, it's uh, also a graphical thing because graphical representations bring clarity to exactly how uh, all the things that you have done, the safety analysis, the uh, testing, the, if you did any verification, simulation, and so on, how all those things uh, help you meet the requirements. Uh, so, and the assurance case is a generalization of a safety case. So if, if uh, somewhere I mention assurance case, all this, whoever tried to follow a standard, whoever tried to uh, do all the steps uh, that they require when you, you talk about uh, developing safety critical system knows how tedious and, and difficult and costly it is. Uh, and it adds a lot on, on the uh, cost of things. So when you do it, you really don't want to make a find a mistake late on in, in, for example, your requirements and you have to go back and do a lot of things uh, from uh, scratch, not from scratch, but redo a lot of things and that's really expensive. You want to catch things early. That's where the whole model-based development and, and contract-based design help us with. Uh, so I'll quickly try to introduce this notion of contract-based design. A uh, contract, when we def define a component in a system, 
contract is defined for each component and is a pair of assumptions and guarantees uh, saying uh, saying that uh, guarantees component guarantees some behaviors uh, if environment in which this component is deployed uh, meets some uh, demands assumptions so that's where the what i said about safety being a context specific property and uh, system level property uh, comes important to when we talk about contracts and safety because the contracts help us define uh, properties or behaviors of components in the context or, or in which they are deployed uh, so be that you use contracts uh, uh, if you use them uh, either as as an informal way of specifying things or formal way of specifying things they, they still can uh, bring a lot of benefit uh, um, so the contract as a component assumption and guarantee uh, for example they represent um, abstractions of the actual implementations of the component what this helps you with if you define a contract this abstracted behaviors of your component early on you don't need to have the implementation yet in place in order to start uh, analyzing your system and verifying certain requirements and consistency between things uh, once you do get the implementation that implementation can be a matlab simulink model from which you can generate code for example if you talk about software uh, then once you do get the implementation you can check that contract against this implementation and verify that implementation actually uh, uh, implements correctly this contract. This contract is ve valid uh, with respect to this implementation, meaning all of the analysis that you've done before are good. Uh, so this is something that, that a contract-based design helps with, uh, uh, even with independent development, that you as a, someone who's uh, integrating things, uh, you can specify your contracts, abstracted behaviors of component, uh, and then give it to your supplier that should develop this component in compliance with these contracts. While the supplier is doing that, you can still do analysis while you have this contract. So it gives you opportunity to early on start analyzing your system and finding problems. Uh, when we have this and we want to do assurance uh, uh, on top of contracts, uh, then we can, what we do is we associate each of these contracts with different evidence. So uh, consider this small system uh contracts are on each component defined on each different level uh, and what evidence do we actually gather for these contracts well well uh, do they correctly implement the implementation be that the model or a source code or if it's a physical component uh, does the contract correctly represent uh, the, the the actual component the actual uh, thing uh, and of course whether the contract correctly if we talk about formal contracts whether they correctly formalize uh, the requirements they are addressing because uh, when we talk about assurance it's all about requirement uh, satisfaction the evidence that you could use here to support the contract it could be a testing result that you have done on your component it could be some kind of formal verification uh, even reviews depending on the level of rigor that you use for your contracts but all each of them uh, has their own evidence and when you do analysis on them then this evidence is very important that you have trust in your contract uh, so what i've mentioned before about the graphical representation of a safety case this is a very small pattern if we want to say these rectangles are goals and um, we want to structure how a top level goal is supported by lower level goals and here we want to say that the requirement is satisfied with certain confidence if we want to use contracts then what we would want to uh, let's say argue over in order to say that the requirement is satisfied with sufficient confidence we want to say that this requirement is correctly formalized uh, by the contract uh, that we want to use and we want to say that the uh, contract itself has been found valid uh, and and sufficiently complete so uh, those are sort of the two main things that we want to do when we talk about requirement uh, satisfaction with contracts uh, so all this when we do it for a traditional system um, so perhaps okay uh, there is no much time so i'm not going to go into uh, many of the uh, specific details but uh, 
big challenge assuring open ad and adaptive systems um, on top of this. Uh, and I just want to touch upon how contracts can help us with this. Uh, so these systems are systems that are frequently updated, uh, learning component that they have learning components like AI and machine learning or open boundary systems like uh, collaborative systems. Um, one of such systems is vehicle platooning, for example, or swarms of robots or drones or autonomous uh, drones, rovers, etc. Uh, and they have their own specific, uh, their own specific um, problems. Uh, that we need to tackle. So while in this uh, project in, in Safeco with DTU and Melodan University and many others in Europe, um, we came up with this notion of assurance con safety assurance concept where we uh, deploy a runtime manager in each of the uh, vehicles. This is when talking about collaborative robot, uh, collaborative uh, systems, but it also applies for when we talk about learning systems, then we would apply uh, deploy this runtime manager in that system, in a single system. Uh, and this runtime manager uh, as essentially contains these uh, these contracts and checks their validity during runtime. Because when we talk about these systems, for example, um, if you have a vision component powered by AI or uh, machine learning, you may have contracts on it, so specifications uh, that cannot be fully guaranteed uh, during design time because the component itself is changing, it's learning. Uh, or the system uh, boundaries is changing or the environment in which it is deployed is changing. So we don't know everything uh, up ahead. The models that we uh, build upon are changing. In that case, we need to, uh, during the, the deployment, we need to gather the information and use that information in our uh, safety case. Uh, and that's what we call dynamic uh, safety assurance. Uh, meaning we gather runtime information and we use it in, in uh, assurance. Um, so the runtime manager that we used had a dual role. For example, it can act as a state manager when we're talking about degrading performance in respect to uh, uh, failures, so in terms of graceful degradation. And that's what you define with contracts also. Uh, uh, you can detect, uh, you can detect uh, uh, when a failure happens and degrade to a certain mode, but also you can detect if there are any uh, violations of, of uh, uh, if there are violations of contracts during runtime and that undermines your uh, safety analysis that you did before that can happen if models on which you have done your safety analysis are not complete enough uh, so you have missed something your models are not the good representations of the reality for example uh, and that's what uh, if the uh, runtime assurance can can uh, uh, detect sort of uh, and, and point out in this assurance uh, goals uh, so I'll I'll just go through this part, uh, which is a tool supported. Uh, so this was what I was talking about, uh, something we worked on uh, uh, in the Safeco project. But now, uh, in the uh, Resilient Software Engineering Group here at NASA, we have uh, three main tools uh, that um, we've been using for in in, in our, uh, for example, rover case studies uh, uh, to actually do this. Uh, and those are advocate that's a tool that uh, covers a full span of uh, that i think you will hear more about it in the keynote about uh, uh, safety engineering starting from analysis to safety assurance and uh, we have a tool called fret uh, which helps us to formalize safety requirements if anyone tried to make these contracts or formal requirements knows how tough it is so fret helps us to do that to formalize uh, from natural language requirements to uh, formal uh, formulas, LTL formulas. And we have a COCO sim, which is a tool uh, that's an add-on to MATLAB Simulink uh, that helps us verify these contracts. So what happens is, Advocate, we use it for analysis. Uh, we gather the requirements there. Uh, we use FRET to get automatically the contracts that we talked about. Uh, and we use uh, add these contracts in COCO sim to uh, MATLAB Simulink models. Uh, which verify these contracts and generate uh, later on assurance in advocate. So we've closed the whole loop that I, I briefly talked about. Uh, and if anyone is interested in these things, check out these tools in particular uh, on our webpage. Uh, so yeah, to conclude, safety case needs to adapt for security aware, uh, open systems, learning systems, it needs to be more dynamic. Uh, contracts can help us with those things. And there are tools 
uh, that can help us with uh, getting those contracts, checking those contracts, and also making assurance and dynamic assurance uh, based on those contracts. So uh, thank you all for the attention. Thank you for that, Ivan. We will return to the main uh, track now. And uh, I also know that there can be many ways to formalize these things, and it can also just be uh, Word documents if needed. Uh, from what you told about in contracts, but also formal methods. Thank you.